magic morning on Munchak. Roy is offered a buck double bill. This old boy on the, the right hand side is a, a little bit more like David and myself. Battle worn and uh, a little bit uh, chubby and bull like in the face. The beating line, Dad Richard explains his love of being part of a great British tradition. And I'm in Corsica on driven boar and pheasant. Yes, recent good behaviour means I too can play away. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. It's rare for Roy to hunt Muntjac. You've just got to get your, your whole stalking etiquette altered to looking and thinking about Muntjac rather than being used to looking for roe or looking for fallow. Yeah, you've just got to slow down, just look in the understory and take everything in. Muntjacus Reeves' eye is rapidly expanding across the country, but it's yet to make its presence felt in Roy's natural habitat of Kent. So if he wants one, he needs to travel to Munty country. And that's why we find ourselves in a wood in Bedfordshire. It's evident that this is a wood managed for pheasants, but something else is enjoying the blue vending machines. We're just having a quick chat and now they're obviously trying to stop the deer knocking the feeders over constantly, but you can see one's been going through, you can just see the pins there. I think it's a fair trade. Some good manjacks talking for a little bit of weight. Roy is a guest of Mike Eatley and Barry Wells of MuntjacStalkingUK.com. Mike has known Roy for years and because he's got plenty of nice bucks on this ground has asked if he'd like the chance to take one. And as we know Lord Lupton never looks a gift buck in the mouth. Well unless he's shot it and is ageing it of course. Muntjac are so unpredictable, that's the fun with Muntjac. We stalk them on foot, we very rarely use high seats, we, we hope to find a number of deer every stalk, probably 15 to 30 deer every time we stalk. Predominantly we, we, we stalk in, in heavy woodland. We do have lots of other ground. We, we stalk over uh, in excess of 6,000 acres. Animals cross our path and Roy tries the call. We get a response but someone has played this game before. Then a nice young buck steps out. Yeah. We were just going to stop up and have a call. And that little buck, well, I say little, he's a very nice buck, just came out and started feeding towards us a little bit. But he just came, kept coming forward, kept coming forward, so there was no shot. And then, luckily for us, he just turned broadside, coming back across. Yeah. Roy, like many hunters who travel here from across the world, finds this feisty little animal thrilling to hunt and totally intriguing. He is an absolute little corker. So we're not into the, the medal classes with this one. Um, but Mike and Barry have both very kindly said that we may be able to try and call another boy in and have a little bit of a play later on in the day and see what we can do. But he is absolutely gorgeous. Um, yeah, really, really nice, beautiful representative buck. And I mean, again, just fascinating little creatures. Obviously, they've got their, their teeth for a little bit of display and for fighting. Um, but they've got massive scent glands as well. So, obviously, they are a musk deer, which is one of the oldest forms of deer there are. Where they are so small and they're used to living in a, a very tight um, undergrowth. That's how they, they communicate with the other deer about, um, you know, they're constantly scent marking and obviously giving a lot of uh, a lot of markers and a lot of clues off because when you're in a thick um, understory in a forest, then you are relying on other cues rather than your eyesight. And interestingly, I don't think their eyesight is quite as keen as some of the other deer species, um, but they definitely rely a lot more on their hearing and their nose. 
Roy shot a buck that um, is, is probably just below a uh, medal class. Um, nice uniform head, two good brow points, which, which will add to its, uh, its score. Probably about four years old, I would suggest. That's it. Maybe a little bit more. Probably, nice, nice, good, top quality cull buck. Barry is the resident gamekeeper on this bit of ground. We've seen lots of deer passing through, but what about the density of deer? Yeah, I often, I often do get, you know, asked the question, how many, how many deer are there? And, and in honesty, you just don't know. Um, I would say maybe we've got, we've probably, probably got certainly 200 deer in here, without a doubt. The, the, the amount I see when I'm feeding is, is pretty substantial. And we've got some good old bucks as well, some very old bucks, very good heads. Take the initiative though and, and protect your, your feeders. Yes, well, I've had to, yeah. I'm going to say I, I trap every feeder. I mean, last year the squirrels were the worst damage. I mean, we had uh, 198 squirrels last year and I'm already up to 42, so that's the main problem. Um, I also think uh, in a wood, spring feeders are better than the, the tray feeders because the deer can get to the trays quite easily, so hence why I've put steel around the feeders. Um, seems to work, seems to work. We are about to call it when Roy spots another buck and Mike gives him the nod. I just don't get the, the opportunity to sort of stalk a lot of them, Jack. Look, as again, seeing a, a piece of ground like this that is so well managed for Munchak as well. Um, the guys obviously know their deer very well, and to have the opportunity to take a, a beautiful buck like that is just super. Thick old neck on him, isn't he? He is beautiful. How are his teeth, is he? Worn down one side. And with, I mean, with the canines as well. I mean, obviously, you, you know, as we spoke about before, they have been known to have a good tussle with the dog, and they can oh, they, do. Yes, they, they can cause a lot of damage. And obviously, you, you know, there's, there's there's evidence there that he's been fighting and he's been scarred up by fighting with the, yeah, you know, with other bucks. But is it a lot of um, interaction, you know, fighting with their with their antlers, or is it more with their teeth? Would you say? Well, certainly with the with the dogs, we find that they they, they seem to split them across the across the withers. Here. Oh, really? So that they hit the dogs so across they, there. Yeah. So that's not that's not necessarily with the antlers. That's with the teeth no, more. I would, I would suggest that's with the teeth. Yeah. They are that sharp. And on the the teeth are quite sharp on the inside, aren't they? The inside, yeah. We were just having a, a closer look at them down on the floor, and the uh, the older buck has got a bit of a, an Aladdin slipper going on over there with one of his toes. That's obviously just bent over and then growing back in and it's chipping off but yeah, obviously there's no no hoof care for these guys outside so if they, the, uh, the hooves on soft ground do start to curl up they can really become extended and curl round and grow into their um, into their legs in extreme cases or keep curling round so yeah, if, that, if that gets any worse it does make it quite uncomfortable for them so uh, yeah, he was certainly an old boy Absolutely corking that. So you've got the pedicles here on the younger buck, a lot longer, and then the antler coming up from there, whereas as they get older, because obviously each time they cast, they, they lose a little bit of bone off the pedicle. So the pedicle over the years decreases. So with an older buck, they are going to have a shorter pedicle like that lengthwise. As Mike was saying, against the ear, they look very similar in length, whereas this one has got a much longer antler because the pedicles receded. I mean, looking at these two boys face to face or next to each other like that, it really does show the, the tale of age. So you've got the youthful, the youthful young man, quite slim in the face here on the left hand side. And uh, this old boy, boy on the, the right hand side is a, a little bit more like David and myself a little bit battle, battle worn and uh, a little bit uh, chubby and bull-like in the face. Both lovely bucks, aren't they? Yeah, 
Superb. Again, I mean, it was Roy has had a wonderful morning thanks to Mike and Barry. If you want the opportunity to stalk Munchak with MunchakStalkingUK.com, then drop them a line and they'll sort you out. Well done, Roy. And we'll be hearing more from Dr. Doolittle in 2018 as he has adopted a couple of Munchak and they are proving a fascinating addition to the Lupton clan. Now for someone whom Roy refused to adopt, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Denmark has voted to allow falconry and has increased the quarry list for bow hunters to include large deer species. For Danish hunters, it's a public vote of confidence in what they do. Falconeering is back in Denmark. It's been away for 50 years and now it's finally legal again. And they opened up for um, a test period for hunting uh, big game red deer, fallow deer, Sika with bows. This is Christmas, birthday, first child, all wrapped up into one. Like, I don't need any Christmas presents this year. I am done. That's it. The Northern Shooting Show being held in May in Harrogate will have a film festival. Sponsored by Gunmaker Zauer and organized by Byron and his brother Daryl Pace, the DNA Hunting Film Festival aims to showcase the best of what it means to be a hunter in the modern world and will embrace the link between shooting and conservation. Visit pacebrothers.com forward slash DNA Film Festival. A 17-year-old American hunter has shot a mountain lion that tried to attack him. Jake Altina became only the second confirmed person to shoot a female mountain lion in Iowa in the last 100 years. He was out deer hunting with his family near the Little Sioux River when the animal appeared 15 feet from him and, as he described it, kind of made a quick jump at me. How much do aunties care about bears? Not much, it turns out. Three Americans said they would rip up their state $2 bear hunting permits if the aunties raised $500 for a local soup kitchen and an animal shelter. The aunties decided not to put their hands in their pockets and accused Michael Bush of Mountain Mike's sports shop in New Jersey of trying to discredit the people who oppose the hunt. And finally, a German hunter has used a drone to follow up a wild boar. He took pictures of an injured boar on a drone. Then his friend Eike Ross of German hunting magazine Unsuriakt used the GPS info from the photos to pass to local boar trackers. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Now, the British shooting show is coming up in the new year. Here's some information. And we will be going to that. Later in the show, we've got Driven Wild Boar. Right now, it's beating. A few weeks ago, we heard from the youngest member of the clan. Next up, it's Dad Richard on the beating line. <laughs> Richard introduced young Jack to the beating line, just as his father Peter had done with him. It was after a break of a decade or two that he returned to the role. Since then he has seen his son flourish and he's taken the opportunity to start working his labs as a picker up. I think people, especially my friends, they just think, oh, you just go out into wood and walk it through. You've got a analyze the birds, see what the birds are doing. You know, if there's a gap, if there's a big gap, you've got to push yourself round, you've got to think about it. Because at the end of the day, the guns are paying for these birds and we want to make a good show for them and get as many birds out there as possible. There's not a lot of shouting in here because you know where you've got to be and they know where they've got to be. So we all work as a team and we work really well, I, I think. Yeah, so I was heavily into the clay shooting. Bedfordshire County Champion two years running, <laughs> my claim to fame. 
Um, game shooting wise, I'm, I'm not really bothered. Um, just, I'd rather be this side to be fair. But I do enjoy my beaters days when we have our beaters days. Really enjoy that. Um, yeah, but rather be this side I think. A bit of exercise. I definitely, yeah, go home at night and you're like, oh yeah, it's nice to get in the chair. Yeah. Sounding older than yeah, I know, yeah. <laughs> then when I look at Jack, he's on the sofa and he's crashed out, so you know that he's had a hard day. Do you take time to analyse and maybe talk about the guns and, and sort of backstage? <laughs> Better not say too much. Um, no, usually this, this squad of guns are really good. It's nice to stop and have a look at the shots. Then you get a rollick in to uh, keep your eye on the birds and not the guns. So uh, we, we tend to get a sneaky look out there and see how they're getting on. I've got a ceiling shirt on, a uh, ceiling jumper. On the top we've got the marsh jacket and the marsh trousers. Fantastic bits of kit. This is actually a new one I've got on today. My other one is about five, five, six years old now. Um, but yeah, it's um, really good stuff, really hard wearing. Keeps you dry from, from the minute starting right to the end. Do every Saturday from when they start, which is September time, and I take days off in the week. I'd love to come every day, but I just can't do it. You have to go to work, earn the pennies. Both of us love it, we just absolutely love it. For more information about Zealand clothing, go to zealand.com. And for more information about the range of Skinner's working dog food, go to skinnerspetfoods.co.uk. Thank you to all involved. Now, if you thought Corsica was a magical Mediterranean island getaway full of surly men and angry women, well, I've got an addition for your preconceptions. It's got birds and boar as well. I went there to find out. The first thing I spot about Corsica is how beautiful it is. And then there's the smell. They say you can smell Corsica before you see it when you're approaching it from the sea. It is an island covered in herbs and, and the extraordinary aroma of myrtle wherever you go. What I'm hoping is it's also an island covered in wild boar. Well, I'm in luck. I am staying at a hunting resort on this Mediterranean island and it has lots of wild boar. Despite the Jurassic Park style gates, they assure me that the 6,500 acre domain d'Ortolo is not fenced. On the estate itself, it's practically pork soup. I am here for two kinds of driven hunting. The first is in the Cork Oak woodland on the coast, and they are using a local hunting dog called a Cursinu. The second is in the mountains, which rise sharply up from the coast, and there they use hounds. Owner of the estate, Paul Canarelli, tells me about the origins of the Cursinu. Le Cursinu is a chien qui est très complet. The, the Corsino is a very complete dog, that means that uh, his eyesight, as his smell, is, is very good. Uh, originally the dog was used uh, by the shepherds uh, to, to guide uh, the, the sheep to the different fields, but also to protect uh, the, the, the herd of uh, whatever would, could happen. And also, they are very, very friendly dogs. And they're today, uh, since several uh, hundred years, also used for the hunting, also because they are very, very quick, determinate dogs. They need to be quick. The reason for that is the extraordinary speed of the boar. The ones I see on the estate roads are grubbing around happily. The ones on the drive are rocket powered. My neighbour, Roland Zobel from Hunter's Path magazine, is quick enough to shoot a boar. So do they, they go a bit faster here than your... Oh normal? yes, they are. They are fast and they're coming very like an explosion out of the bushes. So it's a very great experience. You can hear them when they approach, but you never can tell when they pop off the bushes. The man who put this trip together is Laurent Huard from Magic Safari Lodges, which prints a catalogue of the best hunting lodges in the world. Um, this is a resort that operates also, of course, in the summer, uh, without any hunting, of course, a lot of fishing also, but also family time. Uh, in the winter, as nobody's actually really travelling uh, to Corsica to come and swim here in the winter, uh, as the owner has been passionate about hunting for the last 25-30 years, he decided with the rest of the estate to turn it in into a hunting ground. 
and I think they've done a quite unique job with uh, mixing as well the tradition of, of the Corsican hunt as the, the driven boar as we know it today uh, everywhere else on the continent. The next day the hunting party moves to the mountains. The Corsinus stay in their kennels and the beaters bring out legia hounds of various breeds. Instead of lines, the guns are dotted across the hilltops and valleys. The gamekeeper, Constant Boulard, explains his strategy. We have what, one group of hounds that way, one group of hounds that way, one group of hounds that way, so, and one behind us. So all of beaters and the hounds, they walk in the same places, different places, and like that, all the, the dogs will, will drive and will run after balls a bit everywhere, and we've got hunters a bit everywhere, on the drive actually, on the way of balls, in the middle of the bushes. Well, maybe it's because I now know what to expect, but this strategy works for me. It's the end of the drive and I'm still absolutely flying. It was 15 minutes ago, the boar came out of nowhere like boar do. Luckily for me, it wasn't a very challenging shot. He walked up, bang, went down, bang, another safety shot. That was a, I mean, that was a few seconds. But for the whole of that drive, for the whole two hours of that drive, is what I love about boar shooting, driven boar shooting, is that the, the countryside is turned up, the scenery, everything, volume, picture, you're absolutely on the edge of your seat all the way through it. It's my, it's my desert island sport. And looking at him, he's a good looking boy for a, for a Corsican pig. He's not a bad size and a lovely pair of Donald tusks there. The good thing about a press trip is there are plenty of experts who can tell me about my boar. Well, I think it might be at least five, six years or maybe older. It's very difficult to judge here because the wild boar are a lot smaller um, than, than um, on the mainland. Um, you would have to look at the molars, how worn they are and at the front teeth, um, how worn down they are because the tusks is, um, is very, are very difficult um, to judge because if you look at the size of the boar and um, the tuskers, it, they look big here, but on a, on a boar at that age in Germany, for example, they would look tiny. Okay. So that's a very difficult so, thing so to take you're, the saying, you're saying my tusker is tiny, is that what you're saying? Um, no, not actually. Well, <laughs> size doesn't really matter, does it? Thank you for confirming that, Nina. There is bird shooting here, both driven and walked up. The topography is perfect for partridges and OK for pheasants too. There is walked up pheasant, partridge, snipe, woodcock, duck and even thrush and blackbird, though apparently crows are protected here. And there is always the possibility of stopping to enjoy a barbecue that the kitchen has provided specially. Now that is nice, even if the weather is unusually wet. The Ortle Valley is deeply luxurious. You can book two days of shooting and three nights for eight people in a villa for between two and three thousand pounds per person. If you fancy it, contact the estate via mertily.com. Now, for all you naysayers, Mr. Wright, who believe that's the first boar I've ever shot? Well, it's not, it's my fifth, but I'm still averaging one boar for every four driven days I shoot. It's still the most exciting sport in the world, in my humble opinion. From Corsica next to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. As Prince Harry heads to Germany for a Drukjagd, there are lots of driven wild boar films on YouTube this week. It's the height of the season. This is a trailer for a forthcoming film on the Polish border north of Berlin from German channel Hunter Brothers. Elsewhere in Germany, Dear Eine Jäger sees boar and roe deer on this hunt. Not such a good shot on the boar, but a tracker on the beach saves the day. Germans are not exclusively obsessing about boar at the moment. On the Jagd Total channel, three friends team Bunsi and Karsten are out after tar in New Zealand. Deer in North America next. Cam Haynes and Joe Rogan head into the mountains of Utah for the Alcarat as part of their Ridge Reaper series. Foxes are occupying Australian shooters' minds and the views through their scopes. In this film, Peter Nobes takes 12 of them. A number of rabbit shooting films on YouTube this week. In Otago, New Zealand, Howard Halliday is working his spaniels and shooting what they flush. In Morocco, Badra El Azri is on a hare hunt with plenty of action. He has a website about hunting in North Africa that's worth a look, though you will need Google Translate if your Arabic is 
isn't up to snuff. Badra Shasa.tk. And finally, British channel My Yorkshire Hawks and Pals have their Harris Hawks out, and in the end, they bag a pheasant. It's not an easy sport, and he apologises for the language. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the I symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that is it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please pop over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. You can subscribe to us on YouTube and you can pop your email address into our constant contact box and we'll contact you about this show field sports britain is at 7 p.m uk time every wednesday and this has been field sports britain good hunting good shooting good fishing and goodbye <laughs>